Okay, let's begin, shall we? Please take your hymnals and turn to page 275. 275. It is well with my soul. Let's all stand, shall we? Page 275. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. Satan should buffet, though trial should come. Let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. On the last, and Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sighed, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Amen. Have a seat. Of course, you know we're going to do it a little different tonight, so we want you to be aware that I just got something on my heart I got to share, so I'm going to share it. Not right now, but after the next song. But I thought this was interesting. I saw this. I thought y'all should know. There is a pastor in Fort Collins, Colorado. He's been in the ministry for 27 years. And it gives the name of the church, and that's irrelevant. But it says he is opening. He has a, uh, let me see, how does it put this? He is opening big, fat pastor spirits. He said, if you think back, Jesus' first miracle was making alcohol. And so he is selling his products at the local liquor stores, and he's hoping to distribute it to other liquor stores and restaurants. Since he began pastoring this church 27 years ago, home brewing and winemaking is his hobby. And he wants to leave a legacy for his children who are all involved with the distillery. The distillery is launching with a gin and a vodka. A bourbon, that's probably what Jesus made, right? A bourbon-style whiskey, an American malt whiskey, and an apple brandy are also on the way. He is pastor of the Vineyard Church. How appropriate, huh? We, we are in a sad day, man. We're in a sad day. When he can do that and then accuse the, lo the Lord of giving his neighbor drink. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the offering. I don't know what it's for. I don't know who it's for. We're just going to take it. It's not for Stephen. But if you want to designate that, do that. Okay? Ushers, are you ready? Go ahead, come forward. 
don't give yet, come up here and then. You, you know how to do this. Ready? We're going to pray. Ready? Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much that all that we have you gave us. And so now, Lord, we, through offering, we give back. Uh, maybe some tonight need to give their tithe. Some want to just give an offering. And we're thankful, Lord, how we saw you provide when Stephen and Christy uh, were about to leave. You, you provided, Lord, and we praise you for that. And we just want to give to you because that's what you said. And, and Lord, I, I need to learn that whether you bless me or not, I need to give. Because it's always good to give to God and you can do what you need to do with it, Lord. And we want that to happen. So thank you, our dear Father. Thank you for all you give us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 270 in your hymnals, I would be like Jesus. You know what? Let's go ahead and stand. Let's all stay. Give you a time to get up and stretch. You know how strong Stephen is. So 200, oh no. It's Christy who's going to be long. 270. Earthly pleasures mainly call me. I would be like Jesus. Nothing worldly shall enthrall me. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. He has broken every fetter. I would be like Jesus. That my soul may serve him better. I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. On the third, all the way from earth to glory, I would be like Jesus. Telling o'er and o'er the story, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song. In the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. That in heaven he made me, me, I would be like Jesus. That his words well done may greet me, I would be like Jesus. Be like Jesus, this my song, in the home and in the throng. Be like Jesus all day long, I would be like Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated. Chapter 4, if you have your Bible, please turn there. I'm doing this for a couple of reasons. I don't trust Stephen and Christy for one reason. Second reason is there are people that can't be here that we don't want them to think that we always do this. This is different. And uh, 
we appreciate your turning out because I'm excited to hear how the Lord uses other people and I'm excited that he can use something that we would consider non-ministerial. You know, not, but God still can use you. He can use you at work. He can use you at school. He wants to use you wherever you go. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 10. Verse 10 through verse 13, if you're there, follow with me. I promise. I'll go quick. Right, John? You believe that? John don't believe it. I'm mad at him, so I need to prove him wrong. See, when you talk about me like that, you get sick. Well, you noted that, right? Philippians, you have it? Chapter 4, verse 10. Whose speed are you going to read at? Thank you. He said, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. People will say to me sometimes, did you hear about so-and-so? And I'll say, well, no. Well, how could you not know? I said, why? Well, no, you know, nobody. Well, it was on Facebook. I said, well, I'm not on there, so I... You know, the way we communicate today is different than they communicated then. They didn't know, the Philippians, the, the church at Philippi did not know that Paul was in prison in Rome. So by the time they got the word and sent something, that's what verse 10 is saying. That by the time, he said, you didn't have the opportunity. The fact that it's been a while. He said, verse 10, he said, you're also careful. Maybe they waited. Maybe they thought he died. Why? Because it wasn't like, send it in the mail now. And it, can you imagine how, it, how long it took then? So you have to put that in context. So he says, but I rejoice that you, at the last, even at the end, or maybe he's kind of saying, you know, it's been a while. He said, but you did do something. And then he tells them, verse 11, keep that in mind. Verse 11, he says, not that I speak in respect of want. In other words, there's nothing I want. He said, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Amen. Understand now, he's in jail. He's not relying on them. It wasn't like he could text someone, bring my stuff, bring my book, bring me food, bring me a burger, bring me a slice of pizza. You know, bring me, bring, he, he didn't have, if he said, they didn't have a post office like we have. They didn't have phones or email. Just think of it. So he said, I'm in jail. I don't like it. I don't understand it. But he says, I'm okay. He said, I have learned. Verse 11, look at it. He said, not that I speak in respect of want. I, I'm saying that I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Verse 12, he said, I know both. Notice verse 11, he said, I've learned. Notice verse 12, he says, I know both. He said, I know how to be abased, and I know how. Notice, I know how to abound. I know how. He said, everywhere and in all things, he said, verse 12, I am instructed both. I am instructed both. Both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. Now watch me, because some of you aren't going to get this right. Some of you are going to miss this. Some of you got you've got this notion in your head, and you got to make sure that you put things together right. So let's get this straight. Paul is in jail. Hello. Paul's in jail. He is trusting the Lord. He knows when he has a block, he'll be fine. When he has nothing, he'll do fine. Correct? That's what he's saying. He's saying, I have learned. He said, I know how. This is what I've had to do. So when he didn't have anything, it wasn't, watch me, when he didn't have anything, it wasn't that God didn't love him. Right? He just learned that sometimes you don't have a lot. And sometimes you have a lot. He said, but either way, he said, I've learned to let the Lord work. But I, I do what I 
need to do. Then he says, verse 13. After he told us how he gets by, after he tells us how he, he's learned to be content, he said, verse 12, I know both how to be at the lowest, I know how to be at the highest. He said, everywhere in all things I am instructed. I learn from it. Did he want God to change it? Did Paul want to be in jail? No. He wanted to be free. He wanted to be out. But he said, you know what? God has a reason. And I've learned in whatever situation I go through that all I need is God. And then he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. I'm not mad at you. I'm not trying to change the way you live. But here's what we think. We think that Paul got a little piece of paper and scribbled on the paper Philippians 4.13 and sent it to Philippi. You can't grow as a Christian by flipping your Bible open and pulling the word. That's where we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't expect God to do everything for us. You with me? I didn't ask you if you like it. I'm just asking you if you're with me. You, you and I have to be careful that we don't miss that we're doing what we learn. God's not going to do everything for you. Your mommy didn't feel sorry for you and clean your room. She said, you clean it. And you didn't say, but mommy, if you love me, you'll clean it. You know what my mom would have said? I'll show you love. So often I think we've become lazy. When there's something we can do, we pull out Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. That's That, that verse is for the impossible. Now understand, it's a dangerous mentality to live by one verse. I think it's a great verse. But what Paul is saying there, I'm in jail. I'm in prison. I don't like it. It doesn't matter what I have or what I don't have because I can get through this. I can do this. And before Paul told the people at Philippi what he could do through Christ's strength, he made sure they knew that he learned and he knew how to be blessed no matter what he had because he put his trust in God. You, you can't make this verse sound like you set your mind, verse 13, I can do. You set your mind on it and poof, it happens. That's not the way the Christian life works. Right? You, you understand, don't you, that Paul is telling us and the Philippians that he got strength from God to live whether he had little or whether he had a lot. Would not Paul, if we take the average, if you take the average mentality of that verse, I can do all things. trying to do. God's not trying to give you everything that you want, but Paul is saying, I've learned something. And I think when we want God to always rescue us, I want to be rescued, don't you? I want to be rescued. Man, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to sit in jail. When he writes from prison, The fact that Paul is stuck, stuck in jail, makes verse 13 seem untrue. 
I've heard people say, well, if Paul really trusted God, he wouldn't be in jail. That's foolish. That's foolish. But sometimes that's the way we live. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just having a struggle. I, I just don't know what to do. He says, it's nice you sent me something. Verse 10. It's nice you sent me something. But he tells them that he was content with what he had before they sent him anything. He said, I've learned. I've learned when I have nothing to be content. I've learned when I have a lot to be content. He's telling them that God was taking care of him, that he was in jail and he might only uh, uh, have a little, but he was strong. And God, God would do what God wanted to do. But you know what? Don't miss that there's something God wants us to do. Has anybody ever quit smoking without God? I'm not talking, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking at you. I don't want some of you to go, I thank God. I'm saying, has, has, has anyone ever quit smoking without God? Has anyone ever quit drinking without God? Of course. I think that's where we have to be careful. There are things that you and I can do. God's not going to step in because we're lazy. God's going to step in when it's impossible. Because there's a lot of things that are possible that we need to do. Huh? Huh? I mean, you, I know you want, oh, you just sit there and talk. Well, I, you know, I get mad at God every day about John and Lucy. I say, oh, well, I don't need you. ways are far above our ways. If that verse was true, like the average Christian or average, say what you want, average independent Baptist quotes it, then poof, 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 we should have everything. But there's something that God does when we go through something. That's what Paul is talking about. I can do all things. He said, I can go through little, I can go through lot, I'll be fine. So he throws in, by the way, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. You know what? It's possible for you to read your Bible without God's help. I'm just struggling. I, you know what? I'm just, and I hear that, I think, you know what? Lost people far surpass us in so many things every day. And we're, we're just lazy. You know, I'd like to pray, but I'm so busy and I start falling asleep. Paul, being content, didn't depend on what he had. You know, when I throw up Philippians 4.13, well, I want God to do something special for me, then I'll be content. Hey, God, you said if I want it, and you do this, and then I'll be okay, but you got to do this. You know what Paul said prior to that? You don't even need verse 13. I don't say, Pastor said, take verse 13 out of the Bible. I, I didn't say that. I'm saying that we have to be careful. Because there's the possible that you and I can do. The possible. Was Paul in jail? These aren't trick questions. Was Paul in jail? Did he want to be there? Could God get him out? Did God want to teach him something in jail? Obviously, I'll tell you what. I don't know what you think, but I think there's one guy I'll be preaching. It's Paul. Does it make any sense to me that Paul wasn't out on the streets? It makes no sense to me that Paul wasn't in a boat going to jail. But look, already, you and I don't even have the gospel because of what he did. God had different plans. And you and I just have to trust God. The strength that you and I need will be strength to be content no matter what we have. I know that just 
rocks your whole world because you want God to be your Santa Claus. You want him to just dish out stuff. I do. I know that you go through that because I go through that. There's a lot that we can do that God helps us with, and I'm sure Paul had to push himself not to worry. But when he got through those lean times, when he got through those times where it didn't seem like he's going to make it, he pushed himself to do it. That's the I can do all things. There's so much that you and I ought to do. You, you and I can do better and we ought to be better. And that will happen when we realize that's what God wants. But don't expect God to do, and you've heard this. You, you, your mom used to tell you this. Don't expect God to do for you what you can do. They went to Costa Rica because they could go. And you know what you and I do? Lord, reach, reach somebody in Costa Rica. Why should he do that when somebody can go? Huh? Do you want him to like drop? What do they speak over there? Spanish? Do you want God to drop Spanish tracks from heaven? That's what we think I can do all things through Christ. Means it doesn't. It means we ought to do what we can do. What can you do? Can you read your Bible? You ought to read it then. Can you pray? You having trouble with some discipline in your life? Why should God step in and do what you can do? When you're in a situation where you can't do anything and you really honestly don't know what to do, if I was in jail and they're going to kill me, I would be saying, Lord, I don't know what to do, but I'm trusting you. I need to learn that this is where you want me and you have a reason for me being here. Paul said, did he not? You read it. I've learned. I've, I know. I know, he said. I know. He didn't say I'm trying. He said, I know. He, said, he didn't say I want to learn. He said, I have learned. And he attributes what he learned when he had nothing and when he had a lot. He attributes that, he attributes that to the fact that he did it through Christ. I'm going to pray. I'm not going to make you walk the aisle. Stephen might. I'm not going to make you walk the aisle. But I want you to think about for a moment what you can do. What you can do. We don't talk about that a lot. And I know we have a great God. You couldn't get to heaven, so he said, I'll take care of that. But you know what? You can read your Bible, so he's not going to take care of that. And you could witness to people. He's not going to take care of that. Right? Your head bowed, your eyes closed. Dear Father, may we see what we can do. We so often talk about your power, and you are God. You know what I mean. And if anybody's struggling with what I'm saying or how I'm saying it, you, you help them tonight. Holy Spirit, you, you help them. You show them exactly what I'm talking about. But I pray that I will do what I can do. Too often we just sit back and go, well, I'll just trust the Lord. And that's nothing but being lazy. Help us, Lord, not be lazy. Thank you for servants. We think tonight of Stephen and Christy. Thank you that they weren't lazy, that they left. And I know it was hard for them to be gone, but you used them. Thank you, Lord. And may you tonight speak to someone here. Maybe they're struggling with giving something up. They keep acting like you should do it. Maybe they just need to say, like Paul, I, I need to learn and I need to know what I am supposed to do. And, Father, there are people tonight that if they're watching something bad, you're not just going to step in and unplug things or put a blinder in front of their eyes. You expect them to say, look, that is wrong. I'm not supposed to do that. I'm not going to do that. And lost people do that all the time. We talked about that, Lord. They quit smoking. They quit drinking. They do all kinds of things. Help us to do what we ought to do. 
Help us to learn whatever we go through, whatever our situation, whatever our circumstance, we're supposed to learn. We're supposed to know what we can do and know that the strength to do it comes from God. Your head bowed, your eyes closed. You say, preacher, God is speaking to my heart tonight. There's something I need to do before we leave. If that's you, I'm just going to do this one time. God is speaking to you. I shouldn't have to push you or prod you. You just say, uh, my, your head's bowed, your eyes closed. Preacher, God is speaking to me tonight. There's something he showed me I need to take care of. I need to, if that's you, slip it up. Slip it up. Slip it up. All, all across here. Slip it up if that's you. If you haven't, up and down if you haven't. God speak to me. God speak to me. Dear Father, I want what is in your word to be the controlling factor in my life. I don't want to just quote it. I want it to be true. I want to be able to say like Paul, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. He said, I know both how to be abased and how to abound, how to want and how to have everything. Help us to learn that our strength to do that comes from you. And we can do that through you. But help us not to expect you to do what you expect us to do. Make that clear. Be with Stephen and Christy tonight, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I'm just going to start because what, what Pastor was saying was definitely uh, me. When Steve said, I think it was December, right before Christmas, he said, hey, Gretchen and Ryan want to know if you'll come too. And I just looked at him like, you're crazy. I said, how inconsiderate of them. I have four kids I, who are very busy and active that doubles the price of a police officer, which they should know what a police officer makes, you know, and I'm thinking all that, and I was angry. I thought, how dare they think to ask me two months in advance <laughs> to go? I said, tell them maybe next year. And he said, okay. But um, he said, well, they really have a large group going, and um, they don't have enough workers. But I said, well, you know, maybe they should have asked in, like, September or something. You know, like, too bad. And I didn't pray about it. I just said, no, no. So um, then he came back to me in January, <laughs> which I could tell he was tiptoeing. And he said, you know, they, they asked again, so are we not? I said, you go. I can't go. I'm not, I can't go. And he said, did you pray about it? I said, um, I said, no. I said, I just know God wouldn't want me to go because <laughs> I have four kids, blah, blah, blah. And um, so I prayed about it that night. And I said, God, you know, if you want me to go, you just got to take control of everything. And I, I, I need that peace that that's what, where I'm supposed to go. And it's just a great feeling, you know, that peace that, okay, he'll work it out. He'll work every step out. And he did. He just, everything fell into place. I didn't really have to do anything but be willing. And he, and, and I kept thinking about, you know, I'm not, I don't have a neat job. I'm just mom. You know, I'm not a police officer or something, and what, what do people want from me? But I thought about David, and he just, that's what God wants. He wants David's so he can shine, not so people can shine. So I think that's a good lesson to all those moms out there. You have a purpose, 
You know, you just have to be, let God shine, because he wants to use those little people so he looks good. But anyways, that's got my little part out, and let Steve start. Hard to follow that. Yeah. <laughs> just to go along with that, it was a rough beginning of the trip. I had just got back from Ecuador in September, and probably December, they hit me up the first time. They're like, we had a cancellation. The person that was going to teach this area had to cancel now. Is there any way that you can go? And February is a really bad time. Stuff going on at work, and this is—it's just not going to work. And they said, "You know what? This would be a good, a good one for your wife to come to." We had a cancellation. It was a husband and wife that canceled. We have room. See if she would want to go. So I talked to her the first time, and and I was okay either way. I thought, "You know, this is a bad time." If she says no, that'll be an easy answer to give back. Hey, you know what? We we talked about it. We, we can't go. So they kind of, I kept hearing from other guys that were going, and then they asked again. Now it's January. And we talked again and prayed about it, and like, she, like Christy said, it was one of those things where it's, it's not us doing it. God put everything together, and it just fell into place like you wouldn't believe. And I know it's, and it's on the other trips, it's easier for, for me to go and talk about it, and oh, you know, it's hard on me and stuff like that. But I know at home it's hard on her. She's at home with the kids, and I'm not there, and I know it's just as much of a sacrifice on her part to be home. So I knew that both of us gone, this was going to be rough, and it's hard on me, but I know it's harder on mom. So it just fell into place, and everything, even down to the plane tickets. When I showed up, because we bought our plane tickets three weeks before we left, and we were down there with some other people, and they had bought theirs six months in advance, and they couldn't believe how much we paid for those tickets that how in the world did you get tickets so cheap I mean I know why but everything just worked out so we showed up the uh, first day which was we left Indianapolis at we had to be there at three in the morning to go through our stuff and leave and we flew from Indianapolis to Houston and Houston into the capital city which is San Jose then it is Versus Ecuador, it is nice going into Costa Rica because Ryan knows everybody there. So as soon as you get off the plane, there's a separate back way they have for you. You bypass all the security and everything and out the back door to a waiting van with snacks. <laughs> so he knows, he knows how to take care of us. So this is back at the uh, what they call the ministry center. There's actually, it looks like a pole barn. It's kind of what it is. On the front part, there actually is an apartment. On the bottom, they use as offices, and upstairs is where Ryan, Gretchen, and his two daughters live. It's, it's pretty small, but that's where they live. They kind of use this for everything. They have church in there. They have Bible studies in there. They have camp and VBS and all kinds of stuff. Then in the back, there's a second floor. If you go up the steps and to the right, there's like two small rooms and a bathroom. That's kind of for couples. That's where we were. Then if you kind of go up and to the left, there's a whole bunch of bunk beds. And that's where all the guys that are there by themselves without their wives. So we had the nicer room. Came into our room. It was pretty small, but it had chocolates on the bed and stuff. And it was ready for us. Um, everything down there, if you can kind of see, they have a new gate up and some new uh, electric fence on the top because they like to steal down there. And if it's not bolted down, they will take it. So they have a lot of problems with theft, and so they have to make sure the whole place looks like this, which does make you feel better at night that their electric fence is keeping you tucked in. This was um, the range we visited on the first day. So we got there on Friday. Saturday, we typically leave open what we call instructor day because this is guys from all across the U.S. We had... Uh, people from Michigan, some uh, Pennsylvania State Trooper, uh, Ohio, Missouri State Trooper. Just, it was kind of a big group. And Costa Rica tends to be a larger group of instructors, so I think there was 20-some of us from the U.S. that made it down. So Saturday we take to take all the instructors to the training sites. This is one of the sites that got uh, 
kind of dumped on us at the last minute, which turned out to be just gorgeous because the places that we were going to use, they had to cancel. So this particular range belongs to what they call their OIJ, which is Costa Rica's equivalent of the FBI. Anything that happens in the country, they're the main uh, investigation department that would do forensic stuff, and they have a SWAT team, and it, it really uh, replicates our FBI as much as, but it's called OIJ, or they would pronounce it Oihota. So they have a big range, they had a big gym, and they had a lot of nice stuff. So we ended up getting this last minute, but it was nicer than anything they've ever used. It was just kind of us meeting to talk about how this plan's going to go. We've talked um, on Skype meetings, trying to put together what we're going to teach, and everybody kind of has a what we call operations plan of what everybody's going to teach. So we know what we're going to teach, but now we come together for one day and we try to put it all together. This is where we have um, all our meals. We're all fed there in the morning and uh, in the evening after we get back. A typical day would be up at 4.30. We had devotions and breakfast at 5, and then the bus left at 5.30 so we could get our place in the traffic jam trying to get across the city. So we'd be crammed in that bus for a while, and the, the traffic is the craziest thing down there. There are a lot of fatalities, a lot of people die, because they all drive like they're losing their marbles. This was us at church. Typically, when we'd been there in the past, we kind of visit, visited smaller churches. This is kind of a very large church in San Jose, which was kind of neat to see. We had seen all the little hole-in-the-wall churches, but this was, they run three services on Sunday, and I think a service on Saturday night, because they, it's packed. They have a Christian school, an orphanage, it's very full. The nice thing was, sitting in the service, they were so big, they had a translator, and she would translate the message, and you wore an earpiece, and she would translate it in English. So that was kind of neat that we got to, we got to hear um, they told us we're going to be in there for the one service, kind of present the ministry, and then we'll uh, head out. We're going to head to like a men's group, had a thing going on, and then we're going to go to Sunday school. And somewhere in between there, the church had their own cafeteria, and they served food. So we stopped in there for some snacks. This was um, one of the Sunday school classes. We got in there, and they kind of had already started. And then I looked away for a minute, looked back, and... This is Christy cutting out uh, little birdie, little birdie crafts that they were going to do later on. This was uh, us teaching. They wanted to see a, a kind of a demo of what we did. So there were some stands they kind of sat out there. And we were just talking about some of the hands-on stuff we would do. And it was a chance for them to uh, just be able to see what we did. I think it, it rained just for a little bit. And they, um, it was funny because um, well, we got there Friday, or sa yeah, but Saturday Ryan came up and said, you're going to teach at this, at the, after their church service. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, they're, they want to see it. And, and none of the guys really knew it, <laughs> you know, so he's trying to, the poor guys look, you know, they all have their different. Some are really good at shooting and training and with teaching others to shoot, but they don't all know this type of fighting. <laughs> so I got some, it was just funny watching them trying to figure it out quick out in front of all the Spanish people. I'm like, you guys are making us look stupid. You know, get this down. But they got it down pretty quick, and they were all laughing pretty hard. But it was funny because it was so last, mi <laughs> last minute, and, but they all did good. And they liked beating on each other. And there was a few moves that Steve's like, I got pictures of. He's like, what? What moves that? I was like, I don't know, but we won't tell them how bad they looked. But they got it. Eventually. Eventually. <laughs> this was the first day, kind of typically, because we haven't even talked or met with anyone yet. So this is the first day. Um, we got there probably about oh, 7 o'clock. They were supposed to be there at 8. And they kind of start pouring in. And this is kind of from all over the country. Um, I'm trying to think of the number of departments represented, but there, some of them were driving two and a half, three hours a day one way. So drive in, go to class all day, drive home. 
So this is, we're blessed because this is a, they, word has traveled so much in this country that there is a fight to get into these classes. There's a waiting list. Ryan's always turning people away. And we start to want to wring Ryan's neck because, well, Ryan, we can't have this class bigger than 80 people. There, there's not enough of us. There's too much to do. 80. So he'll tell us, all right, guys, we're up to about 120. Like, no, Ryan, we can't do 120. Then he's up to 130. So always laugh because we always take on more than we can handle, but it always works out. So this is the first day they're getting there. And it's just kind of neat to see the look on their faces because everybody that shows up just is kind of, why are you here? What's the real reason you're here kind of when you walk into that timeshare meeting for the first time? Like, uh, what, what are you trying to sell me? So what's this going to cost me? I know at some point this is going to cost me. Yes. Because yeah. Training for free. They go for free. So that's kind of a, the departments love it because they'll never get anything like this. But everybody wants to know what the catch is. Um, another scene, George, makes me think of this. Costa Rica is an interesting country. Everything there is driven by insurance. Insurance drives everything. If you're on a six lane highway and there's an accident, there's two sets of police that show up the municipal police and the transit police. The municipal police show up and they investigate the accident. The transit police show up and they direct traffic. But the vehicles, even if it's minor, the vehicles cannot move until the insurance adjuster gets there. Because everything in that country is about insurance. So, and we kind of laugh, um, down in Costa Rica, the fire department. The fire department is not funded by the government. The fire department is funded by insurance companies. Because the quicker they get there, the better job they do and the better equipment they have, the less of a loss. So we're passing fire departments nicer than we have back here. And the, fire, the firemen, which is usual, the firemen have everything. <laughs> they have, I mean, state-of-the-art equipment. and So their training isn't really lacking because a lot of U.S. companies go down there and train them because the insurance company is paying for it. The police get nothing. What they make salary and their equipment I and mean, the stuff they show up in is dangerous. Hasn't been used in a long time. I mean, most of them are wearing vests that are expired. It's just not a priority. So they're getting there the first day. We're checking guns because as you can imagine, nobody wants to get a bullet in the back so we check and recheck and triple check and trying to make sure through a translator, no bullets in your pockets, right? No extra magazines we don't know about, right? Just trying to make sure, because once we get going, we don't want any accidents to happen. And that's what Ryan always kind of preaches to us. He says, tactic has never had an accident. We don't need a first. If we have one accident, this ministry is done. If we need to take extra time to be safe, we will. So as much as we can, we make sure that uh, none of that, uh, everything's triple checked. So this is kind of the first day we're in the auditorium. And everybody's there, and I think it was 100 and 126 in the class. So they're all there, and again, they're from all over, and they're from different levels. You have a person, we had a guy in our group that he told me the last time he shot his gun was 15 years ago. And that was when he was in the academy, and he shot 25 rounds. Uh, and then you had, there was a guy in our group his name was Daniel, and he was on the, uh, the Oihota, like their FBI has a uh, national SWAT team, and they handle all their terrorist stuff. To him, and he had come up here and trained with our special forces and in Israel and trained with them. And one of the mornings, he was late because he left at 2 a.m. to go get some terrorists and shot seven people and then ate breakfast and showed up for class. So it was just kind of an everyday thing for him. So there's quite a different range of training. So we're, you know, trying to cater to that. So that's the first day. Ryan's typically explaining how the week will go. We pass out Bibles that first day. Um, they get there. You can kind of see one there. They kind of have a, a book that kind of gives them just information for the week. And then it has their list of verses that they memorize to get the stuff, to get the equipment and boots. And that was probably the most equipment I've seen us bring down. It was just tons of stuff, just boots and all kinds of stuff. And of course, 
wrong intentions, but they're eyeing that stuff because they don't have, some of them are wearing tennis shoes, they don't have boots. So kind of going over that, how the week's going to go, and then we kind of start breaking out from there. Um, this is one of the guys that he actually retired from the Kalamazoo Police Department, and then he raised support, and now he's down there as a missionary full-time. And the first day, he started getting real sick, so he was kind of getting tended to, and this is kind of a kind of an everyday thing where we're all worried that we're going to be the one that gets really sick. You know, we're down there in a foreign country. We're every th we all ask if someone gives us a drink, what was the ice made with? Or vegetables or fruit? What would they wash this with? Because, yeah. So he got sick and wasn't feeling very good the first day. This is, we're outside the first day. And you can see the line in the shade. I was trying to stay in the shade because... Usually I realize that the sun is too hot when it's too late. So I got burnt pretty good, and she said, you should put some suntan lotion on. But I did after I was burnt to a crisp. But I told her, I said, nah, I'm going to try to stay in the shade, but it didn't happen. We laughed about this because this girl, I think Priscilla, her uh, husband had been saved, oh, I forgot what they said, eight or nine years ago in a course. So now she comes to help as a translator speaks perfect English, sweetest lady, but it was real hard in the translation. I'm screaming at him, you know, you need to play patty cake with their face. And she's translating it. I'm like, this doesn't have the same effect because she's not yelling like I'm yelling. <laughs> so they hear me yell, they don't know what I'm saying, and then they hear, and they look at her and just wasn't having the same effect. But she did a great job. So here's more pictures outside. Here's where we're kind of divided up inside. He always kind of divides them into platoons. So here they're set up in three platoons. And then here's all the instructors. Every platoon kind of has a flag. They kind of run it very, you know, military-oriented. Uh, military and they'll, they'll come in every day with their flag as a platoon. And they're assigned training as a platoon. So it's to kind of keep them together. And he splits them up on purpose. So a lot of people from the same department don't wind up together. They're kind of split up, so they have to uh, get out of their comfort zone a little bit. This is a quick video. Ryan, at the end of the day, loves doing commando challenges. This particular day, they had to do a whole bunch of stuff, and they're pulling a bus full of instructors. So this was a typical day. The rest of the week, the gymnasium was ours, so we kind of had trained in there all week, so it was kind of nice. It was out of the sun. It was warm in there, but out of the sun, so we would kind of get a group. This was a little bit different than uh, Ecuador in that it was such a large group. What we would do is we would split up, so essentially I, uh, we would be in this gym and we would teach the same thing three times. So we'd have two-hour blocks. We'd teach a class for two hours. The next group would come. We'd teach the exact same class. So we would teach the same three things uh, throughout the day. Here's down at the range. They're kind of divided by platoons again. They're getting ready for the next day's training. Did a lot of uh, firearms and just different things, a lot of things that they never get a chance to do. No one's ever showed them, practice. Most of these guys shot more in that week than they probably have in their career. They shot a lot of ammo, which is, which is good for them. Here was some of the stuff. There's a bunch of tables that go back here, and they were just lined up. And I don't know if I ever got the exact number of verses that were memorized, but it was in the thousands of verses that were memorized for all this stuff, knives and about anything that you could think of. And they were just, and it's free equipment. And for people that don't have much, this was a big deal. And while it was the wrong intentions to get it, Ryan kept talking about, you know, God's word doesn't return void. He's like, you know, even though that they're going to do this for the wrong reason, they're going to remember, remember these verses, especially when we talk about them later in the week. So it was just neat to see that happen. This was our uh, small group, which we kind of typically get divided into just smaller groups. It's more one-on-one. -on -one. It was kind of something they experimented with. Um, 
a lot of trips ago and they felt like maybe it was better that you had a couple of people that you could really get in contact with. Um, I always like to look for the guy that just looks like he doesn't need God at all, the roughest looking guy, and sure enough, the first day, here he comes. And he's got skull tattoos down his arms, and he's got beard, and this is the guy, this is the, uh, the SWAT officer I told you, shot seven people, then shows up for, and he comes rolling in on an old Harley the first day, I thought, man, this guy looks rough. He looks like the last thing he needs is God. So... I get my list of six people, and I'm looking at the names, and here walks this guy. And I'm thinking, oh, this is, this is going to be fun. So I get to talk to him the first time, and going back and forth with the translator, and the translator says, wow, this is pretty cool. He says, this guy got saved in a course five years ago, and he's taking uh, theology classes from Liberty University because, <laughs> because he can't get anything down here because it's not accredited because all of Costa Rica is Roman Catholic. So he said they won't recognize anything, so he's taking classes from the U.S. And he told me, he said, um, he's on the SWAT team now, but he knows that God wants him to be a pastor. So as soon as he calls him away from being a SWAT team guy, he's going to be a pastor. Probably the only pastor with skull tattoos on a Harley, but, but he, was, he ended up, he was just a really neat guy. And he prayed hard for the guys in our group, and it, it was just really neat to have them in there. Let me go back once. One of the things we try to do as well in the small groups is there's a list of questions, just kind of so everybody's on the same the path or course. There's a, uh, questions that we kind of have for, they call them coffee breaks. Down there, they're real big about coffee breaks. You have a coffee break in the morning and a coffee break in the afternoon. So we would take coffee pots and we'd make all kinds of coffee and uh, we'd sit in these coffee breaks and there's a question that we would ask during the coffee break and it would be anything from uh, what is truth? Um, what's, the only, what's the way that a person can get to heaven? It's just kind of things to have them jog their memory, and then we kind of talk about it the next small group. We kind of go over scripture and stuff. So that was kind of our chance to do this and a chance to get some feedback. They would, go, they would go home and look up the question. So they had that Bible now. So, like, one of the questions was, why is he the true God? And then they would go home with their Bible and look up, why is he the one true God? So they had to find for themselves. And then we would discuss it the next day of what they found. And then the, next, the question for the next night would kind of feed off of that. So why is he the only way to get to heaven? You know, so they, they had to think about it a little bit and, and find the answer for themselves. And you could see it clicking, like, that's not what I've been taught, you know, because most of them are Roman Catholic. Or, but it was, it was neat to see them. You can see it in their faces here for some of them. They're just really listening, and you don't get that here a lot, you know. It's a lot of looking around, and, you know, but here they're, they got questions. And Ryan had said the first day, he said, you know, this group of officers came and paid for themselves to come and left their families and you know so they're 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 listening because they want to know why we came like Steve said what what's the catch so they're they're very attentive it was neat to watch and i think the they gave the number again when we were down there and i think it was 95% of costa rica's roman catholic so heavy influence, and it's one of those countries where uh, there are no atheists. I mean, there's nobody there that is an atheist because they're so, it's a very strong Roman Catholic. Everybody knows there's a God. It's just, they have a different way about getting to heaven. So this was, we would clean up at the end of the day and get everything loaded up before we'd head back, and somebody left their bulletproof vest behind. So the next morning, we use this as an example of it's important to wear your vest. And remember where your vest is because you'll pay for it in some sort of physical pain. So it usually involves push-ups that we memorize verses at the same time. So there are some of those verses they probably remember very well because we went over them many times. This is 
Uh, this was the, my uh, translator for the day. His name is Marcus. He's actually German, and his parents moved from Germany to Costa Rica when he was younger as missionaries. So he speaks German, English, and Spanish. So he was, uh, he, he was a neat guy. We'd laugh because I think he's the only person in Costa Rica that is driving a Mercedes Benz. And here we're just going over different stuff. And they had a lot of good questions. They would ask questions about everything just because training-wise, they just don't get very much. Again, this is always a reminder to me how blessed we are that, that some of the training we get here in the U.S., they just don't get anything like this. So they are just anything you tell them. They are just so grateful. Here's a group of uh, some instructors here. This guy, I just have to say, everybody called him... Uh, Sylvester Stallone, or he was a Puerto Rican guy. He moved to the New York when he was seven, and the cheapest place they could find in New York was amongst the Italians. So his name is Dave Mendez, but everybody calls him Mendezarelli because he talks just like, and I have a picture, every time he talks, he talks like this. He said, hey, I grew up with the Italians. So he's from, yeah, now he's in Florida. He's a Florida officer. So here was another day of... Uh, prizes, and we took a lot of stuff. I wish I, we would have had a count of all the stuff that was that they said verses for. Some people had, I mean, they were wearing new pants and shirts and boots and hats, and you'd see them with new stuff on hats with tags still on them. They'd be over in the corner with their Bible, memorize the next verses because they're going to get something else. This was uh, a girl in our group, Julie, and I was pretty sure we were going to have to buy a third ticket back home. Because she latched on to uh, Christy and bought her all kinds of gifts and all kinds of stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> Yes, this is Julie. She, um, she was real quiet the first day. She was in our group, and she was um, just, you know, checking it out. And then she started kind of coming and standing closer to me, so that barrier, you know, just, I can't speak, you feel real dumb, you know, because we're standing by each other, and you can't talk, <laughs> like, hey, hey, no, hola, I knew hola, but um, I kept thinking, dumb Tower of Babel, they ruined everything, <laughs> but I, we would, she actually knew as we started, she didn't want me to know right away, I don't think, that she knew a little English, you know, I think she, a lot of them do, and they're listening, and they know more than we think they know, so you got to be careful how much you joke or, you know, the things you say, or, you know, you don't want them to be offended by anything. But I would say the uh, second or third day, she just really said quite a bit. She said, um, you know, I want to talk to you. Uh, alone. I said, well, let me get a translator. She's like, no, no, no. Let's just go over here. I said, okay. I was a little nervous. I like, I don't know what you're going to say or what I'm going to say because I don't know how much you understand, but she said, um, I just really appreciate you guys coming. And um, uh, she, she loved watching us. Because um, they don't have that there, you know. Like, she, I think throughout the week I learned, like, 90% of the women, just because there's kids, but they've been abused. And they don't know what love is or a relationship. And she said she really wants that. And I said, well, he's out there. You know, I said, don't just be picky. You know, you don't, you don't have to not be picky. She said, well, all my, all my um, friends are 30 and married or have kids. And I said, that doesn't matter. You know, just be picky. And, but as we were talking one day, and we both we were just laughing because we both had so much to say and we could tell, but we couldn't talk. And she said, um, I said, if we get a translator, do you want to talk more? And she said, yeah. So one of the daughters of Ryan and Gretchen, this was their first year of getting to translate because it is a big deal 
because you could mess things up very easily with the way their, their words are. You could be saying God loves you, and it could come out God loves you unless you do something wrong. You know, so the parent, obviously, they have to make sure you can speak it very well. So one of their daughters was helping me, and I asked her, um, I said, do you, do you know where you'd go if you died? And she said, well, you know, I, I, um, I converted a year ago because I was a Catholic, but I didn't understand, I didn't, I just felt like you were worshiping idols, and I didn't understand that. And she kept talking about converting, she converted over, I, I, but I couldn't get her to say what she, what she converted to. It's like, what do you mean you converted over, you know, trying to get her to understand, and she, I said, well, what does that, what do you believe? And she said, well, I know God loves me, and he wants me to do good things. So it still sound like Catholic, you know. Well, then you didn't have much time. And But she started crying a little bit. And um, I don't remember what, but we got to the point where we were talking about she felt like she could lose it if she wasn't being good enough. And I said, well, you know, sometimes I get, I see it as I get angry with my children, and I don't, at times, but that doesn't make them not my children. You know, I just, I want them to do good because I love them, but that doesn't remove them from my family, you know. So she just started crying, and it was neat to see things clicking in her mind because, you know, they have been abused, and they don't understand that love of someone accepting them all the time, you know, forever. Um, and it was just, I don't really know how to explain it. You, do, you feel like you want to do more. And I told her, you know, I said, and, and when we get to heaven, by the end of the week, she was saved. And, you know, we talked through it, and she, she is on her way to heaven. But it'll be neat. I said, when we get to heaven, we'll, we'll catch up. And she said, yeah. And I, and I said, we'll probably be speaking Spanish, right? And she said, yeah. But um, now we talk every week on an app and it just translates for us so it's really great so we can just text back and forth throughout the week and catch up with each other so that's been really neat so this was our group actually it was a combination of two groups kind of all of us together um, this was the future pastor and he was uh, pretty excited about someday that he was going to get that chance. He said he's just waiting. So until then, he's taking care of terrorists. Um, the last day after everything was all over, this guy was in our group. His name was Mauricio. He got saved. He had kind of all week, you can kind of see him fighting and kind of struggling. And when they wanted people, and that's a big thing down there, when they, hey, all those people that made that profession of faith come up front. He just wasn't going to come up front, and then we got a chance to talk to him afterwards, and actually it was uh, us in a group, and then uh, through Daniel translating, Mauricio had gotten uh, saved on Friday before we left. Oh, and then we had a big commando challenge. Just a quick background. They're all involved in this. Back here, you can see me. I'm supposed to play the dummy, which was easy. And they all wanted to know how much I weighed. So they brought a translator over, and they asked me how much I weighed, and I told them. And they did the conversion in kilograms. And when they looked at their phone, they're trying to figure out how two of them were going to carry me because they had to load me in a truck. And I want you to pay attention at the end of the video. And I, and I heard him grunting. And I heard him come over and beg Ryan to use three people. (Laughter) 
Okay, the very last part that you didn't hear when I saw this video later, there's a laugh that I recognize. <laughs> and if you guys remember, Gary has been here before. This was his group. He was running him through. And in his translation, he told them, if we're going to win, you need to throw him in the back of the truck like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> and they did. This was, that was the end of Friday, kind of the big, they have commando challenge and these, this team wins and they win a plaque and a trophy and we laughed and we had some uh, pictures and video of the team that won and you really would have thought that they were passing out Olympic gold medals because I've never seen people so proud in their life. There was one guy that was, we watched the video and laughed because he is, he is just, before they could get his name out, he's standing up in the crowd and he is just bumping the air. He was so excited. But this kind of, at the end of the week, this always sums it up for me because it's so awkward the first day and they're kind of wondering why you're there. But man, by the end of the week, every single person coming down that line wants a hug. You don't speak the same language, but they want a hug because you've meant something in their life and they had gifts for us. They had us, they, all of them came out and had flowers and coffee and which with what they make, it was quite the sacrifice. This was, his name was Stephen. He had got saved the last day, and the, just his story, he wanted to tell us his whole story, and it was 45 minutes long, and we're trying not to cut him off, and he was just so excited that he got saved, that he said he'd been searching his whole life and finding all the wrong things and drugs, and got with the, he's actually a prison police officer, and he just was, the look on his face was just something amazing. And I told him, I said, you know what, I'll pray for you. We share the same name. It will be easy to remember you. So that, that was neat to hear his story. Um, this, is, <laughs> this is a neat story. Probably the thing that I'll remember the most is this was an officer from the OIJ. He's the, the FBI, if you will. And Every night when we come back, we would either play a game, not a game, but we call it high-low or snapshot. And we'd go around the table at the end of the day and we'd either say the high and low of the day or the snapshot, something we remember from the day that will stick in our mind forever. This guy's name was Luis. And Luis had a rough life and rough um, marriage and family and job and Everything's not going well, so about three months before the class, it was three months, pulls his gun out of his holster, shoves it in his mouth, click. So he pulls the gun out of his mouth, checks the chamber, there's a bullet in there. Says he checks the back of the bullet for the firearms people out there. The primer of the round has been hit, doesn't go off. He said he was so scared, he said he put the gun on the table didn't know what to do. Time went on, he found out he's coming to the class. He said, but from that day, he said, I wondered why that gun didn't go off. He said, why didn't that gun go off? So he said he shows up to the class on Monday, and he says he's sitting up top, just kind of not want to get real close to people. He's sitting all the way at the back, and he said, he saw, I saw a flag, and it had a cross on it. I thought, oh boy, is this going to be a Christian class? He says, then you guys passed out Bibles, and he said it just, I knew all week, he said, I was getting worked on. And he said, the last day he got saved on Friday, and he said, now I know why that gun didn't go off. So, we're nosy, and we want to know, we said, I got to ask you another question. Is that the gun you used all week? He says, yep. He said, any misfires? That seems about right. So it was just a neat uh, one of those snapshot things. If you could, if if you remembered his face, I just remember his face and the relief, the excitement. And he talked about just being excited, and it's always convicting for us because I got the same gift he does. But I think sometimes you get. 
complacent. You take it for granted. It was a, it was a big deal. And we talked about that bullet. And we laughed about that bullet and said, you know, that bullet comes from an ammo manufacturer that makes 100,000 rounds a day. He said, and that bullet wound up in a box that went to Costa Rica, and it made it to his unit, and it made, that box made it to him, and he put it in his three magazines, and not only did it wind up in the three magazines, it winded up in that magazine, and it was in the top. So we laughed about that and thought, you know, I think sometimes, that without being weird, I think sometimes God's in the business of manufacturing dud bullets at the ammo factory because they're going to wind up in somebody's gun that's at the end of their rope. So that was just a, a neat story. If I remember, there's always one thing that really sticks out every trip, and just hearing his story was just really amazing. The last day after everything's all over, on Friday we clean up, it's late, we pack, we go home, we uh, got to sleep in till 6 o'clock, I think. And then we load it up, and we're going to head to the beach. They said, we're going to take everybody to the beach. We'll eat out there. It'll be a fun day. We'll kind of spend. We always do a big debrief of everybody on the trip. And then um, that night, everybody starts heading home, going back in their own ways. So we went to the, this beach. It was, we drove west, so it was on the Pacific side. Um, just beautiful out there, just amazing. You don't realize this is there when you're in the, the rough part of town and dealing with all the traffic jams. And, but they did tell us, and I think I got a, the videos coming up. We went to a, uh, where the beach was, and they said, hey, and just be careful, there's monkeys everywhere. And if you have a smaller backpack or drinks or anything, they'll come down out of the trees and they'll just take it. <laughs> so we were kind of laughing, we thought, like it was going to be hard to see them, but they were everywhere. <laughs> so well, let me see if I can. So we're laughing because everybody's feeding them chocolate, and, all, and they'll just come and take it right out of your hand, and marshmallows, and... She's feeding them a protein bar, so we're laughing. That monkey will be twice as big as the other monkeys next year. <laughs> and he's eating it. He's got chocolate all over his face. And someone came and brought him a tortilla shell. And it was almost like being back at home. He grabbed the tortilla shell. <laughs> There's no sugar in a tortilla shell. So when we laughed, they stole somebody's seven up. He ran up in the tree, took the lid off, and just dumped it on his face. Like, it was pretty, and there was, there was quite a few of them. I think that was the end. I'll leave that picture up there. <coughs> Is there anything? Um, Am I forgetting anything? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know. It was just, a, we want to thank everybody for the chance to go. Um, it's always a neat experience. It was neat for me when I found out that Christy was going to be able to go because you can take pictures and you can talk about it, but it just doesn't do it justice when I'd come back and tell her about it. And she's doing the best to understand, but you, just, you have to be there and see it and feel it. And it's something you can't, it, you, you'll just never do it justice, what happens down there. Um, we were talking about the... Uh, the devil and how he works when we know something big's about to happen. And just all the junk. Now it's been enough trips. I know it's coming, so it's almost scheduled. I know he's going to make life miserable at work before I leave because I know something good's going to happen. Um, we got there on Sunday, Sunday morning before church. There was a pole fire outside. So no electricity for a while, and we ended up being without Wi-Fi for three, four days. That was our only connection back home to the kids. So I knew that was going to be rough. I mean, again, that's rough on me, but I know that's more rough on mom. Um, and it's just distractions. You're thinking about that like, oh, man, I'm sure it would be nice to be able to talk to the kids. You know, when you get distracted with this junk and people are getting sick and things are breaking and, and class hasn't started yet. So we always laugh and joke that we know it's going to be a good week because 
all the bad stuff that's trying to sidetrack us before the um, week starts. So I believe, I thought they, there was somewhere around 26 that we know of that came forward and got saved. There were some people uh, afterwards that we found out that like in our group, you know, he didn't go forward, but he got saved in our group at the very, very end. And, you know, the neat thing is, is we leave, but God doesn't. You know, they, they have those Bibles. They have so many people down there. They have new uh, brothers and sisters that are saved. There could be work that happens there a month after we leave. So that's always the neat thing is just because we come back doesn't mean that God comes home with us. He stays down there. Um, it is neat to be used, but we're not anything special. If we couldn't have gone, got to use somebody else. He can use anybody to do it. So it's, it's neat to get to be a part of it every time we go, even if it's the worst inconvenient times. It always turns out to be some of the most uh, blessings, and it's always a recharge for me. It's always a good priority. Some of the things we worried about after you leave there just aren't worth your time. The things that you get stressed over and like, wow, I, sometimes it's easy to come back and get things backwards, and uh, that's one of the big things for me. Share the Ephesians 6. Oh, I do have a uh, Ephesians 6. Every time we go, we always go over the armor of God just because we know it's going to be a rough week and there's going to be stuff thrown at us to distract us. So we always make a big deal about reading through Ephesians 6, 6 talking about the armor of God to put this, these different pieces on. I'm just going to read it. In Ephesians 6, 10, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor. And that was one of the things we talked about is it's very specific that one piece isn't going to do you very good. It was the whole thing. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand on the evil day, and having done all to stand... Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. So, we have a coin that we always carry with us, and it has those verses on it, and it has the, it says the armor of God, and it has all the pieces on there. That's just something that whenever we leave those trips, we kind of take with us. That's always a, uh, just a good reminder that we're going to get attacked, not only every day, but specifically during something like that. Another neat thing I, they started that week was they started small groups with just the women because there were so many women officers there. Um, so that was neat to just hear their stories and um, see, you know, you could even see at the beginning of the week with those commando challenges how officers in general there are not highly looked upon. You know, they're very low paid and kind of more of a pain and a nuisance there. And they don't work as a team at all. You know, it's every man for himself. But to see that change throughout the week, group, they cared about each other. You know, they took the women and treated them um, with respect and would help them. Like you could see in that commando challenge, kind of where they just left them behind. You know, it's, we got to win, and I'm, you know, they were just gone. But by the, you know, the end of the week, it was, they were helping them through the tires and helping them, you know, just get through it and um, becoming a team. So that was neat to see. I think that's a big part of learning to work together as Christians, you know, being under attack. And But those little meetings with the women were neat just to get to know them and hear, which I don't, I, didn't, I hated seeing them be officers. You know, the things that they probably have to go through and they're little, you know, and easily attacked. But um, like they said, that's a lower job than working at McDonald's there. 
so that's what they can get, and that's how they earn their way. But to see them grow in confidence in just a week and who they were and God was, was neat and to take care of each other. That was neat to see that, you know, you have a week and a few hours with them. What do you have? Like, I felt like we were there forever every day, but long days. But, um, you know, you didn't have a lot of time alone with them. But they were catching on, and it was just neat to see them grow. And that's not nothing, anything we could have done. That's all God, to see him grab a hold of them like that and learn in such a small amount of time. And now Ryan and Gretchen are going to set them up in churches, you know, get them involved. And they have Bible studies once a week, and they can come if they'd like to come. And it's been neat to read the reports, and a lot of them will send us emails or texts to tell us how it went and what they learned. And so it's been neat. It's been neat to see. It's been neat to be a part of. You know, I was part of it before, and I always thought it was great he could go. But like he said, to be there and be a part of it is different. And it's neat. Neat to see. So neat to see a bunch of officers be soft-hearted and caring, you know, taking care of each other and um, encouraging each other in the Lord. You know, they're all on the same side, and at the end of the day, you know, serving the same God. So that was neat, neat to see. I think we're over a little bit on time. So I have two points. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so I know it's like, if there's any quick questions, we would, we're trying to leave some time at the end to answer any questions, if anybody had any questions. Yes, sir. First of all, thank you for going. This isn't the purpose of bringing questions, but you're asking questions. Thank you for Well, thank you. We had one because uh, there was a there was a guy that everybody called him Osama. He was a taller guy, head shaved, big beard. And the first the first day, he got into a pretty heated argument with one of our guys about uh, he didn't want to have to take that Bible and stuff like that, and said, "You know, your God's a terrorist." He told us that, and they were, but I know that they were working on him all week. And finally, by the end of the week, he it got a little bit better and a little bit better. And he kept saying, he says, you know, I want you to know that Friday when the class is over, I'm throwing that Bible in the trash. Okay. So we kept going on and on and on. Then pretty soon by Friday, they asked him, hey, you going to throw that Bible in the trash? He said, well, I, I think I'm going to take it home and I'll give it to my daughter. I don't want it, but I'm going to give it to her. Like, okay. So, you know, you don't know. He had to sit there and hear everybody's testimony and sit through all that and I mean, even in a week, he kind of, his, his attitude changed a little bit. So we don't know. It may have been the seed that was planted, and, but he was pretty upset the first day, but it was a lot better by Friday. Anything else? Want the mic? I have a question for you. No, the question is for you. Yes. Did you, because I don't, you know, I don't know what you know or see, but did you see a side of Stephen that you hadn't seen before? Oh, yeah. It was really neat <laughs> to watch him train, because I don't, I mean, I don't see that. I don't see that uh, drill sergeant, rah, you know, in there, like, I, I mean, the kids say, Dad yelled at me. I'm like, Dad, Dad didn't yell at you. <laughs> you know, but to see them, um, they respected him very much, though, because he had that side, but he also loved on them. 
So you could just see them, not to praise him at all, because I don't want to give you a big head, but, you know, <laughs> just, you know, to, he used God's gift that God's given him to love on them, and, but to, to teach them what he knows, and that was just neat to see, because I don't see him in people's faces and, and stuff. So that, that was neat to just, and he was my, you know, I didn't have any other distractions, so he got my full attention all week that I've never been able to really give him. So that was, that was neat to do, you know, and just see what he does. And it was pretty impressive. I got a pretty impressive guy right here. You know, he knows, he knows a lot. He knows a lot. I know he's got my back now. Like, I'm all right. I can go tell people off and he'll get it. No. No, so it was, it was neat to see that. <laughs> and he is rather quiet, you know, and you, who? well, who you, who you speak of? you know, he's not the pushy in your face, you're going to hell person, you know, so it's neat to see him, how he, he does, he, how he does that, how he wins souls, you know, it was just neat to see. Yes, Lisa. Well, I think a lot of the verses were the verses they could memorize that kind of went along with it. Yeah, they had a list of verses. And it was neat because they started bringing highlighters and they'd highlight, like, oh, you know, that answers that question. Or it, and you could see light bulbs going off. So it was neat. Yes, Kami. Stuff? There was, there was, it was picked through pretty good, but they just keep it there for the next class, and I think they'll just get it out again. Did we ever get a picture? Oh, we'll talk to you later. Anything, anything else, or? That's it, unless you have other questions. If I, real quick, though, before I forget, it was neat from my perspective to have Christy there. I know she doesn't think so, but, and if you ask her, she will absolutely deny it, but there's probably nobody I know that cares more for people than she does. And if you ask her, she'll tell you no, which is one of the good things, and that's what makes her care about people so much. But when she's there, she's very others oriented she'll say I'm a people pleaser but what she's saying is I care about other people and just to see her work with some of those um, just the girls there the other females there they just kind of flock to her she just looks in a crowd she just looks like you, the face that you can go talk to so it was just kind of neat the people that would go um, talk with her and that's why I laughed towards the end I thought I know we're going to be buying a third ticket for this one girl, the one day she brought her a big old bag of gifts and chocolates and earrings and said, what'd you promise her that she brought you all this stuff? <laughs> so that was, it was just, it was just neat. So it was neat to, to have her there to see what I see and I think it was very good for, for both of us. So with that, no more questions. Thank you. Two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. Yes, sir. I remember the day he told me he was going to go work at the jail. I thought, what a waste. You know, I knew his mom, Amy, said, does he have to carry a gun? And it always scared us, you know, and bothered us. But it's so exciting as a dad, but as a pastor. Because I know, you know, when he gets to heaven, you heard me say, God's not going to say we're so privileged to have the police chief of Napanee up here in heaven. But I think God's going to say the police chief went out of the country to tell others about me. 
That's what matters. That, that's what you ought to be getting from all this. That God, he probably never saw that when he first went to the, the jail and then got on the police force. But that's what counts. They don't care, you know, I guess, as they said, the N was the training. The N was, and that's what he won't tell you, but even here his training is up here. Down there, it's really up here. But his training here is But he's willing. He knows what's important. And he's decided to... It's neat. He, he didn't tell you, but when he asked the mayor if he could go, should go, the mayor said, you're going. You're going. God can use you. Don't, don't think that he can't. You just be willing. You never know when he's going to open the door. Luke 15, it says there's Joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. It says more than over 99 people that don't repent. So God cares about that, doesn't he? God cares about that. Ready to pray? Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Stephen. Dear Father, Thank you for those men that got saved. Thank you for the women that were reached that I know Christy touched and I know that that whole group did, Lord. I'm thankful for what they're doing and people are being saved and they're being helped. They're being pushed and they're being pulled and helped in so many ways. Thank you that they could go. Thank you for, I know, the work that you did in them, not just Stephen and Christy, but the work you did in all those officers. How exciting and Father, help us to be busy here. And I know people are, they worship, it's like they worship themselves. They don't need God, they don't want God. But Lord, help us to just be persistent and pray. And I know that a lot that happened in Costa Rica, there was so, not just our church, but there were so many people and so many churches praying. That's the power behind that. So teach us how to pray like that and keep praying like that. And you continue to bless this ministry, Tactica, and you bless Stephen and Christy. Thank you, Lord, for this night. Thank you for your word. Help us to be willing to go wherever you want us to go to do whatever you want us to do. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.